We'll start with our demotivational poster as usual. Inspiration. Genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, which is why engineers sometimes smell really bad. <laughs> Hope you like those. Something to lighten the mood at the beginning of each lecture. Today we get to talk about belts and chains. So here's an example where some belts and chains are being used to drive a machine, but I don't think I would want to write it. That uh, pillow block bearing there looks like it's seen better days, but you'll notice that there is a chain as the final output drive. And if you look down, you'll notice that chain goes down into the machine. There's actually a cross shaft where the shaft is parallel to the shaft of this amusement ride. And there's some kind of mechanism there, probably a worm and gear set. We'll talk about those later. There's therefore a shaft coming out perpendicular, coming out toward you, and on the end of the face you see a brake and a, uh, a drum there for the brake to act on. You might also notice that there is a V-belt wrapped around behind that brake that apparently goes down to the motor. Now notice they're using a belt system and a chain, but notice that the gear reduction that occurs in the worm gear set would be fairly large, and it's apparent from the shape of the belt and the shape of the chain that there's a speed reduction in both. So the motor speed is much higher than what you'd want the uh, machine to rotate and of course it doesn't have enough torque to rotate it at a high speed anyway. And so the the belt, the V-belt, gears it down a little bit, not much, and I shouldn't say gear it down, it changes the ratio, changes the speed, so it increases the torque, decreases the speed a little bit. Then the worm gear set would increase it a lot more, and then notice there's a chain that's used to take it on, and again it looks like there's probably a small reduction in the chain as well. Notice that the belt is used for higher speeds and the chain is used for lower speeds, but higher torque. Now something you need to remember, Really, a belt and a chain serve a very similar purpose. They're a flexible power transmission device, but the speed range that you use one at can be quite different than the speed range you use the other. Now, here's some terminology that you need to know. When we're talking about a belt, I don't care if it's a timing belt, I don't care if it's a V-belt, if it is a belt, then we call the element that it rides on a sheave or a pulley. Okay, so a sheave or pulley, you do not call it a sprocket. On the other hand, if it's a chain you're dealing with and a toothed sprocket, that is a sprocket, not a pulley. So make sure you get that terminology correct. Now, as we saw already, belts and chains are often used for speed reduction. Now, the, the gear ratio or the speed ratio is usually not all that large. The, 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 usually it's relatively close to a one-to-one. -one. Not always. Obviously, on a bicycle, for example, there's a decent difference. but for large gear reductions of 100 to 1 or so, you either need multiple chain uh, sprocket combinations or you need some other reduction method. But one thing that sheaves and sprockets can be very useful for is tailoring the speed of a machine to a standard electric motor speed. You see, when you buy an electric motor, you buy in standard speeds, nominally 1800 RPM, 3600 RPM, they actually go a little slower than that, but at least most induction motors. There are synchronous motors, but that's that doesn't matter. Anyway, the point is you buy these motors, and since they operate uh, proportional to the frequency in this, this country, they operate proportional to 60 hertz. Uh, if you were specking a motor for overseas, probably be proportional to 50 hertz. But they're still standard motor speeds, and belts and uh, pulleys and, you know, uh, chains and sprockets can be very useful for making a nice fine adjustment uh, to the machine's speed. So how do we quantify speed reduction? Well, it's the drive speed over the driven speed. So in most cases, speed ratio is greater than one. What that means is that most of the time, the thing doing the driving, whether it's an engine or a motor, whatever it is, is usually moving faster than what you want the output to move. Now, that's not actually true for your bicycle, if you think about it. The input is your crank, right? That's what you're controlling the speed of. But if you think about the output speed of the back wheel, in your bike, it rotates at a higher RPM than your pedals do. So in the case of a bicycle, the speed ratio is actually less than one because the drive speed is lower than the driven speed. But in most machines where the motor drives at a fairly high speed, you usually don't want that much, usually a motor has good speed but not good torque, so what you usually do is run it through some type of gear reduction or belt chain reduction system, whichever it may be. 
and uh, reduce the speed so that the driven machine is what you want it to be. Now you can calculate that speed ratio as the driven diameter over the drive diameter. It doesn't really matter if you're talking about uh, sprockets or pulleys. Uh, you can also use the number of teeth in the case of a sprocket, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Now the the tangential velocity, or what's, what would be known as the belt velocity, or even the chain velocity, would be equal to the radius times the angular speed. Now you've got to be careful with this, because you notice we've got diameter, uh, diameter 1 over 2 to calculate radius, but omega would have to be in uh, dimensionless per time units, so radians per second for this to work. And a lot of times you want to plug in numbers in um, uh, RPM, for example, as a speed. Now, in the example problems, I'll use an equation that takes care of all the conversion factors for you. It's really convenient. I didn't include it in the slides, but you will want to either write it down or put a bookmark there or highlight it or something when we get to it. But we'll get to that in an example problem. Now, notice that the, the surface speed or the tangential velocity is the same on both pulleys or both sprockets regardless of the uh, number of teeth or the, the diameter of those things. And that should make sense. That should explain why one ends up turning faster than the other because one has a larger uh, radius than the other. And so to accomplish the same distance takes you know uh, less turns. So uh, hopefully these equations or these ideas will help. Now focusing on belts for just a moment. Typically belts are the type where you you run into two problems. Either it's moving too fast or it's moving too slow. At too high a speed, so when the, the surface speed, that tangential velocity, is greater than about 6,500 feet per minute, you can end up with all kinds of problems. You can end up with vibration problems. The belt can whip, uh, which is um, another type of vibration. You can end up with um, the, the belt as it goes around the pulley, think about just a segment of that belt. The forces in that segment can be very high if it's moving too fast because it, it has to accelerate towards the center of curvature at a very high rate. And so the, you know, basically the amount of force required to just make it turn the corner around the pulley is so high that the belt can tend to pull out of the pulley. So that's problematic. So you, rule of thumb, keep the belt speed for V-belts and, and other uh, belts less than 6,500 feet per minute or so. Now on the other hand, if the belt's going too slow, then you can end up with too high a torque. And students often get confused about this. They understand the high speed thing. But what do we mean by too low? I mean, why would it be too low? Wouldn't you just decrease the amount of power? Well, understand that when we design a uh, system to transmit power, we have a certain amount of power in mind already to transmit. Okay, so we can't change the amount of power. So if we decrease the speed of the belt, we will have to increase the torque. And eventually the belt would simply slip. The, the amount of torque just can't be generated by the friction between the belt and the pulley, and so the belt will slip. And so at too low a speeds, the re torque requirement is too high in order to transmit the desired power. Uh, a good guideline is to start a design with about 4,000 feet per minute on the tangential speed of the belt. That'll get you in, in the ballpark and then you can, you know, you got a little leeway there where you can increase the speed a little bit or decrease it a little bit to tailor the speed ratio if necessary. Here's some common manufacturers with links I thought I would include for um, belts. I simply took them from my own experience, belts that I used, and I thought you might want to look them up. Uh, but these are all manufacturers of, of rubber belts of all kinds and uh, obviously other products as well. So there are several different belt types. So far I've been leaning my conversation towards V-belts, although I haven't specified that specifically. Um, and V-belts are the type that you see in figure A there. So it's a wrapped construction. R belts are made of rubber and reinforcing material. Now the, the rubber itself is very flexible. You can stretch it. You can strain it, right? And it will stretch like crazy. You really don't want that with a belt. Think about trying to transmit power with a rubber band, right? it simply will just slip because it can stretch. And so you have to have something to reinforce it, to keep it from stretching. And so there's a basically a spine in the back of it. Some, some uh, Just like in a tire, there's all this um, uh, reinforcement uh, that is stranded. And there's actually a tremendous variety of reinforcements available. You can get Kevlar, you can get fiberglass. There's just a very wide range and they each have their own strength and weakness depending on the application. Now often the outside surface of the belt also has some reinforcement embedded into it so that the, the sides have, uh, don't just give when you try to squish on them a little bit to get some friction. Now 
Part A is the, or figure A, is the one you're probably thinking of when you think of a V-belt. But there are also die-cut V-belts. See, here's the problem. What really kills V-belts is wrapping around the smaller pulley. Because if you think about it, a V-belt, imagine just a belt in your mind. And basically what you do is you, you bend that belt, right? And to wrap around the pulley, you have to bend it like a beam. Well, the, since the top doesn't give, uh, the bottom does give. That means the bottom gets a little bit wider, right, and a little fatter. So that the stress, the compressive stress in the lower section can cause trouble, but it also causes tremendous tensile stress in the reinforcing material. And that really is the Keeley's heel of a, a V-belt type system because of the belt wrapping around the smaller pulley. So it's really the size of the smaller pulley that determines, in large part, how long the belt will last. Now, how do you keep a beam from having so much stress when you bend it? Well, you can reduce the height, right? And if you reduce the height, you reduce the strain, how much it has to stretch to around the corner, and therefore reduce the stress. Now, you reduce the strength, but in this case, we're not trying to make a strong beam. We're trying to make a beam that's flexible. And so the die cut or cog type uh, V-belt has a little bit of material taken out of the bottom so that the effective thickness of the belt is less, and yet there's still plenty of surface on the side for gripping the pulley because um, you need to maintain that. Now there's also reinforcement options here as well uh, just like there are with uh, standard V-belts. There are also, let me jump down to uh, item D, there are poly rib belts. You may know this as a serpentine belt in your car. And this is kind of like taking a lot of little bitty V-belts and putting them side by side so that you end up with a, a lower profile belt that can bend around tighter radii easier because it's, it's not a very thick beam. And this is very convenient in the engine bay of cars where you really need to conserve space and you want the belt to wrap around relatively small pulleys. There are also V-band belts that are basically V-belts sort of halfway between a V-belt and a sync, uh, not a synchronous, but a, um, a serpentine belt or a poly rib belt. Uh, that are essentially several small V-belts tied together. Those are also available, but they're not particularly common in my experience. Uh, let me go to the double angle V-belt, item F. There are belts where you can drive the front side and the back side. This is particularly useful when you have to bend around a pulley in one direction, but you want to bend around another pulley in the opposite direction so that both of those pulleys rotate in the same direction. And so the back side of this type of V-belt can be driven. Finally, there's also synchronous or timing belts, and you may have seen these if you've ever replaced the timing belt on your car. Uh, they, they don't rely on friction like other types of belts do. I may have gotten ahead of myself in the slides. We'll see. Uh, here's a picture, not from my own experience, but from Professor Dew's experience. He has experience in large machine design. I've got experience more in small machine design. And uh, you notice that there are two mo motors mounted on this stand, and basically it's uh, both images are the same thing, just from different uh, angles, so that you can see both sides. And both motors have a set, let's see, it looks like it may be two or three V-belts that are mounted side by side. Now one interesting thing about V-belts, if you use a multiple V-belt pulley belt like this, you actually need what's called matched V-belts. You can't just go buy uh, belts that are nominally the same size. They have to be, they're not made quite that precisely. And so you have to buy a matched set in order to make this work uh, well. Now, you'll notice that the shafts on the larger V-belt pulleys go through the frame and are supported on belts and then ultimately drive, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see it in the second photo, they drive a couple of synchronous belts to keep the uh, two uh, in time. Now, the whole purpose here is that you, there, there are shafts coming off these. You can see the shafts going back to the machine, and there are offset weights, and it's really important that those weights be timed together because you don't want the machine to shake back and forth. You want it to shake up and down. And if you time the weights carefully as they rotate, the left and right shaking forces they're generated can cancel out, and the up and down shaking forces can be multiplied or you know uh, doubled, essentially. And so it's important that the uh, the two shafts remain in time with one another and inside of that gray box are most likely gears or something to keep them in time because you know up to the the point of the uh, uh, the synchronous belt pulley there's nothing to force the motors to stay in time the v-belts can slip so um, hopefully this is a good example for you from an, an industrial machine
where V belts and synchronous belts are both being used. Here's another view of a similar assembly. You notice there are two V belts here. This is a little bit smaller one, but it's the same overall design with synchronous belts and V belts. V belts are designed to ride in a groove. They're not supposed to bottom out. There is supposed to be some clearance at the bottom. And there is something called belt ride out. There's several different um, uh, dimensions that are important. There's the sheave outside diameter, the amount that the belt rides out of the sheave, the groove depth. Uh, there's even more than this. There's the groove angle. Uh, but what we really want to focus, focus on here is essentially the pitch diameter. You see, the, the belt contacts the pulley on the sides, right? It has a lot of surface area to generate plenty of friction. And so um, the question becomes, since the belt is so thick, what is the effective diameter? It essentially, what's the gear ratio? And you need the effective diameter to know that. So the, the pitch diameter is what we usually talk about when we're talking about pulleys. But when you're designing a machine, if you design it to only have enough space for the pitch diameter, you've forgotten that there's actually more pulley and the belt rides out of that pulley when it's working properly. So there's the outside diameter plus the belt ride out to consider when you're performing design. Now belt tension is really important. You have to have enough tension to prevent slipping. But if you have too much tension, what will happen is as the, the shaft rotates, the apparent load from the tension on the belt essentially rotates about the shaft and it fatigues the shaft. So it doesn't mean that if you put too much tension on the, the shaft while it's still before you even turn it on it's just going to snap. No, what it means is that as the machine rotates and operates it's going to snap and, and fly off and probably kill someone which is horrible, right? So it's, it's critical to have appropriate belt tension and often there are belt guards as well that are very important so that if something goes wrong you don't have a high speed pulley flying at you. Uh, but too much tension will break a shaft by fatigue. It's very important to follow manufacturer's recommendations on belts. Every, you know, you might buy two belts off the shelf and they have the same dimensions, but if they're from two different manufacturers, they will have different materials and will perform differently. So it's very important to follow the manufacturer's uh, recommendations. It's also important to have a maintenance schedule to check the tension in the belt regularly because these belts do stretch. And uh, a common way of checking the tension in the the belt is to do a deflection test. So you either go down to a particular amount of force or go down to a particular amount of deflection and measure the force, one or the other, uh, in the sort of the middle of the belt span. And those two have to match, right? You, you have basically a table from the manufacturer that says how much deflection and force the belt should have. Now looking at the belt geometry, there's a lot to talk about here. There's the wrap angle, theta 1 and theta 2. Now notice that the smaller pulley always has the lower wrap angle, and unless you include an idler or something in the belt, but we're just talking about a simple setup. There's the so-called slack side and the tight side. In this particular case, it looks like the smaller pulley is driving the larger pulley, and both are rotating clockwise. And so the tight side is the lower side, and that's what's pulling the larger pulley along. The speed of the smaller pulley, omega 1, would be lower than the speed of pulley 2, omega 2, assuming that there's no slip. And usually we would use the term omega for a speed in radians per second or radians per time. And we'd use the symbol N for RPM, revolutions per minute. Uh, the belt speed we talked about earlier, that rule of thumb started about 4,000 RPM, that's V sub B in this. And then the, the center distance between the centers of the two pulleys is C. The span is a little bit different. It's uh, oriented along with the uh, belt, and so that's given the symbol S. D1 and D2 are the pitch diameters, which is what we talk about more often than not. So the actual pulleys would be a little bigger than this, and of course the belt rides out a little bit. So the tension's highest on the tight side, and uh, really the belt bends around the, the small pulley the most, as I said before. And so since you can only bend a belt so much, this leads to a minimum sheave or pulley size. And of course, the smaller the sheave, the shorter the belt life. To select which V-belt you should use for a given application, there's a chart in your book. It's on page 245, and this is typical of a belt manufacturer's chart. And it just shows you the um, uh, 
recommended belt in certain areas. Now, how do you use this? Well, you have to use the design horsepower on the x-axis versus the speed of the faster shaft. Most of the time, that's the input. That's the, the motor or the engine that's driving, the prime mover. Okay, so that's the y-axis. And all you do is just intersect the design power from the x-axis with the speed of the faster shaft on the y-axis. And whatever region you end up in, that's the recommended size for that application. Now, if you're close to the line, what will happen is a lot of times you can choose one or the other. And there are reasons for going with other sizes than what is technically recommended by the chart. This really just gets you in the ballpark. Now you might wonder, what is design power? What do we mean by that? Well, if you have, let's say you have a five horsepower engine, okay? Think of just something like a lawnmower, okay? Five horsepower engine, and in a bigger commercial mower, you do transfer power by belts, and the reason for that is multiple, but one of them is the blades uh, stick and stop moving, the belt can slip. And that actually wears belts really quickly, as you might imagine. Um, so depending on the particular application, the amount of power generated by the prime mover is not necessarily the power you want to use for design. You might want to include some service factor, essentially. So if the machine can choke, so in other words, if it can stop and lock up, typically you use a service factor of two because there's the chance that the belt will be very damaged every now and then. It'll be, um, you know, I should say abused every now and then. And so the design power is different than the, the input power from the prime mover. It's larger. And there's a, a table. I'll show you it in the example problems. But there's a table that, you know, you choose what the prime mover is and what the driven machine is and read off the service factor. Now, one thing to note about this, the example I gave, a single cylinder engine, for example, is also relatively hard on belts because think about it. As the piston comes around for the power stroke, there's actually a torque spike that's generated because of the expanding gases above the piston. And that's actually really rough. It's a sudden acceleration, therefore a sudden torque on the pulley that the, the engine is driving, and the belt can slip in that case. And so that's damaging to the belt and needs to be accounted for. But that's in the service factor. Now, the, the worse the machine, the more you know, variation in load there is, the higher the service factor as well. Here's an example of a synchronous belt being used, again, from Professor Dew's experience. He did a lot of, of, of uh, shaking type machines, and so you can see the offset weights here. So you can see the synchronous uh, belts to keep the two weights in time. It's kind of interesting. You can see jack screws. These are little screws that you would turn with a wrench in order to locate the, uh, the pulleys. Of course, those pulleys would be moved in order to tension the belt and keep it uh, engaged, but of course there are teeth so it doesn't slip as long as you've got the right range of tension, this should work reliably. And synchronous belts are usually designed in a very similar to pr uh, procedure as V-belts, but the transmission of power, instead of relying on friction, relies on teeth. And so it's very important that those teeth remain engaged, that there's adequate tension for the teeth to remain engaged, that the speed's low enough that the belt doesn't start riding out of the, uh, uh, the pulley, but um, Anyway, there's, there's various standard sizes, uh, and, you know, these have a similar advantage to serpentine belts, so that they're low profile, so they can bend around relatively tight radii without being stressed excessively. Here's another belt. You've probably never seen one like this. This is a double-sided synchronous belt. You saw a, a double-sided V-belt before, and the reason for a double-sided synchronous belt is to keep two sheaves in time with each other that actually rotate in the same direction. If you think about the way that these two rotate, as the belt comes around, if the belt is going, say both are going clockwise, then the belt would uh, spool to the left. No, uh, clockwise. Oh, wait a second. No, this is set up so they can go in opposite directions. I'm not thinking right. Yeah, this is set up so they can go in opposite direction. This must be dr driving another shaker. Um, but you, you get the idea here that now the, the back side is being used uh, so that you can uh, uh, make the machine work. Now, notice one interesting thing about this. There's not actually a very large wrap angle on that second pulley. And yet, apparently this machine works and it's well designed. I doubt that Professor Dews would have included this in his original slides um, if it weren't. But notice that wrap angle, and yet it's able to transmit the, the torque required to keep everything moving without slippage, apparently. Chains, on the other hand, are, are the next step into uh, flexible drives.
And chains are classified by pitch, and pitch is basically just how much space there is between the pins of the links. Now there are many other types of drives besides V-belts, synchronous belts, um, chains, uh, uh, serpentine belts, or poly rib belts. There are many different types, and especially in smaller size. There are some that kind of look like a ladder. Um, there's many different materials available. So what I'm showing you here is not everything that's out there. There are a ton of things. And this is an ongoing area of development. There's new things being made every day. Uh, there's a couple of big names here that make roller chain. I thought I would include them. They make sprockets as well. Um, and there's many other manufacturers as well. One thing about machine components though is it's not always the best idea to buy the cheapest component because you want the machine element to be well designed, tested, and reliable. You don't want your machine to be likely to break unless you don't care about the machine's reliability. But let's talk about chain. So the, the first thing you may be familiar with is just standard single strand roller chain. Uh, then there's also um, two strand, three, four, etc. available where you have a pin that goes all the way through multiple strands of chain. Uh, there are heavy series where the, the link plates are thicker on the sides. There are double pitch drive chains, so where still it may be a nominal you know, half inch chain, but the actual spacing between the links is one inch, but it's to be used with uh, you know, half inch spaced uh, roller chain. Now this is different than one inch chain because the actual distance between the links will be slightly less than an inch. It's designed to work with half inch uh, sprockets in my example. Uh, one inch sprockets would not be compatible with this because if you think about the geometry as you move around the sprocket the distance between two spaces is different than the distance between just a single space. So anyway that's something that is available there's also double pitch conveyor chain now why would you ever be interested in double pitch chain well if you make the um, sprockets have an odd number of teeth what you can do is have the bearing surfaces land on each alternate sprocket every time the sprocket goes around this cuts the wear down on the sprocket uh, cuts it in half essentially well, not quite because you got more load on the sprocket when it is engaged but one of the things that causes failure is as the the chain comes around it impacts on the teeth and that impact can cause damage at the root and on the the tooth itself and so having double pitch chain uh, allows you to cut the impacts down by half which can be a, a huge advantage there are other reasons for having other features on roller chain uh, how do chains fail or chain drives? Well, there's a couple different ways. Fatigue of the link plates is one. If you think about what's going on here, if the, the top side of this animated chain is the uh, uh, slack side and the bottom is the tight side, assuming that the smaller sprocket is, is driving, then as the, the chain comes around the lower side, it's being stretched, right? It's having to pull the larger pulley, or I did it wrong, didn't I? It's trying to pull the larger sprocket along. As this chain comes around the smaller sprocket and goes to the slack side, that tension is released. So basically what the chain sees is tension release, tension release, tension release. That is a fatigue type load and the link plates can be fatigued and fail. There's also, as I mentioned, the impact of the rollers and the teeth as it comes around. The, the chain suddenly has to change direction and it literally impacts. It's kind of like hitting the, uh, the teeth with a small hammer every time the chain comes around, especially at higher speeds. And then there's also potentially galling of the pin and bushings. If the load is really, really high, then the load between the bushing and the pin that the bushing rides on can be very high and material can actually be transferred between the two, and that's, that's galling. So there are many different failure modes. The key to avoiding most of these failure modes is, design, number one, design the, the drive appropriately, but secondly, to provide lubrication. It's critical that chains are lubricated. And there are many different types. There's the manual or drip type, where you just lubricate your chain. This is like you taking the three-in-one oil out to your, your bicycle and lubing it up, right? Um, there can also be drip, which is a little bit more automated, where the oil is in a uh, container and there's a, a distribution pipe where the oil just very slowly leaks out onto particularly the joints in the chain. Um, so that's the manual or drip type. And then there's the bath type. We see that in B where the chain is literally dipped into the lubricant. Uh, 
And then finally, there's also the oil pump type, uh, which is called type C. So it goes from type A to type B to type C, each one being a better type of lubrication. And type C is where the oil is somehow pumped onto the chain. So it's, it's sprayed essentially onto the chain to keep the chain lubricated. But lubrication is critical for chains. Uh, without lubrication, chains can fail, especially uh, in industrial situations, they can, chill, they can uh, fail very rapidly.